Hello, I'm Pauline Larson, and this is Pinky. Hi. Yeah, we're excited to be here and talking to you, power kids. You kids can be powerful for God. It's your choice. The more you get to know God and the more time that you spend with Him and in His Word, but you need to obey God. And that's what we're going to talk about today is obeying God. Yeah. You love God, don't you? Oh, yeah. I love God. He's so awesome. Do you obey God? Mm-hmm. What about the rest of your brothers and sisters? Well, some do, some don't. Well, I guess that's true in life. But I tell you what, I don't want to miss out on anything God has for me. How about you? And I think God, he's got some wonderful things. He's got wonderful things ahead for those of you watching. And I believe that the Lord is showing me that there's people watching this that God, you don't really know God, but God has great plans for you. He wants to reveal some things to you. If you'll just spend some time, get real still, get alone, and listen to him, he's going to show you some things. Anyway, are you ready to do the memory verse? Yeah, okay. Let's put the memory verse up there and say, all right, all right. Help me understand so I can obey your teachings. I will obey you with all my heart. Oh, that's me. I want to obey you. I know. So where's that found? Up there. Yeah, I know. Where in the Bible? Psalm 119.34. Psalm 119.34, help me understand so I can obey your teachings. I will obey them with all my heart. And that's important. You know, you, just, you can't have an attitude, oh, okay, I guess, I'll, I guess so I'll do it. We need to want to obey them. You know, obedience is better than sacrifice, the Bible says. And, and the thing is, we need to want to serve God. He's an awesome God. And, and that's... Um, when we love God and we get to know him, he's such an amazing God. He's done so much for us and he wants to do so much, you know. He's got a plan for each one of us. None of us are an accident. Well, what about the ones who say they were an accident? Their parents didn't plan on God planned you. Yeah, that's good. All right. Now, you want to do the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. The Lord tells us to obey him. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and he's serious about it. It's, there's a lot of people who don't obey God, and they get in trouble. And there's people who end up lost, and they end up in a very real hell because they don't think, oh, well, I don't want to do the God thing. No, it's a relationship with God. And, you know, he created the universe. He's smart. I like what Pastor Benny Thomas said one time. He says, I'm smarter than the average God. Well, yeah, hello. But God is awesome. So now we're going to talk about, as we usually do, the four things that we need to learn about God. And some of you say, I've seen this too many times. Well, can you say it? Can you say it from memory? How about you? No, I can. Okay, what's number one? God loves me. That's right. God loves me. And he loves you. I, you know... Isn't it amazing God loves us? Because sometimes we don't feel like people really do. And I know there's people who love us, but sometimes there's people that we really care about, and for some reason or not, they stop caring for us. Yeah. Or they get mad at us or whatever. But it's a need to know God loves you. And God may not always like everything you do, and rather you change some things, but he loves you. He's not going to, you know, some people, they'll love you if you do what they want. <laughs> They call that conditional love, but anyway, not our God. No, you don't like that. That's right. Number two is, I have sinned. That's right. I have sinned. Yeah, every one of us need a Savior. Even back in the Garden of Eden, wow. You know, they had everything. They had each other. They didn't have a messed up world. And they still blew it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number three is... Jesus died for me. That's right. Jesus died for me. And he died for you. Terrible death. Do you know he actually went down to hell too? Really? Yeah. He went to hell? Yeah. And I bet they treated him really bad because they knew who he was. Mm -hmm. That's awful. Yeah. He paid a horrendous price. Not only was his death terrible, being crucified like that, beaten and scourged. I mean, a lot of people don't survive that. And then having to go to hell, oh my word, I don't think anybody suffered that much. He had the worst probably of anybody 
ever. <laughs> okay, so what is number four? I must decide to live for him. That's right. I must decide to live for him. So, Pinky, how do you live for God? I pray. You pray. Good. And uh, you go to church, don't you? Yeah. We have church. And you read your Bible? Of course. Well, good. You need to read your Bible. Everybody does. And some of you kids might be too young, but a lot of you aren't. But they still got picture Bibles and things, but... Many of you can get a Bible and read it, read it, and get yourself a real Bible. I know people have them on their phones, but it's just not the same. So, anyway, it's uh, time for us, for you to say goodbye. Bye. Okay, we're going to go on our show. Let's put you down here. Let's take you, put you down here. All right. Okay. And we're going to talk today, and we're going to... Last week we talked about nobody quits alone. And in that one, we had Peter, you know, the man, when Jesus came and called him, they all dropped everything, followed him, and it was great. Uh, you know, they didn't even, you know, Peter, you know, he didn't even, they didn't even ask any questions. It was like, follow me. Okay, fine. You would think, well, for how long? Um, can I go say goodbye to my parents or, you know, or uh, what do you want me to do? Nothing. It was just like, can you follow me? Okay. So uh, they did so. But then after Jesus was crucified, and if you remember last week, some of them, they were like, okay, they want to kill us too. And D Peter denied him, you know, and be before he, you know, the rooster crowed finally because Jesus said, before you denied me these times, uh, the rooster will crow. And he thought, no, I'm going to die with you. I, no, 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 that can't happen. Well, <laughs> he did deny him. So now here he is. And, you know, they, he decided to go back fishing. And the others said, yeah, we'll come too. So here they are. They're on the shore. And guess who turns, turns up? It's Jesus. And in fact, he tells them where to cast the net because they had, they had fished and caught nothing. And we're going to go to John 21. And we're going to start reading in verse 1 to 14. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples um, were, were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel, from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see um, who he was. He called out, Fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And I'm going to put on here, this is what happened. See them pulling it in? There were so many fish they couldn't get them all. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooked over a charcoal fire and some bread. Isn't that just like Jesus to do that? Bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon, Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? <laughs> they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. I'm telling you, Jesus, you know, <laughs> Jesus is amazing. You know, he knows everything. 
And when you know Jesus, he'll show you things to come. He'll show you what to do. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about yo-yos. I don't know if any of you play with a yo-yo. I tried to learn. and It was like I let it down and the thing would just not come back up. And I have a son. He was good at the yo-yo. He would even drive it down and have it go outside the car, which is not what you're supposed to do. But he can make that thing roll up. He can make it do different things. And there again, you don't become an expert at something just doing it a few times. You've got to keep at it. And that's when you perfect what you're doing. But there's a time, too, people refer to people, well, they're a yo-yo Christian or a yo-yo person. What does that mean? It means you can't depend on them. They're up or down or, you know, they don't stay. They're not consistent. And we want to be consistent in the things of God. We want to be a person that reads the word, goes to church, prays, consistently does things, consistently has a relationship with God. Not just, you know, some week, oh, I'm on fire for God. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And then the next week, well, I don't feel like reading the Word. I don't feel like going to church. No, we want to be consistent. Consistency is very, very important with your relationship with the Lord. In fact, it is. What if you had a friend and you never talked to him, never had anything to do with him? And then maybe once every six months you gave him a call. They might even recognize your voice. You know, they're going to find people and friends that are going to be more consistent that they get to talk to and be around. Okay. Now, the next thing is, wow, there's a, a smoke detector. That's a warning. It's a warning. But, you know, if, if people have them in their homes and there's a fire, uh, suppose they're asleep and they don't, they're not aware of it. What can happen to them? They could be burned. They could maybe not get out in time. We had some friends that had a heater that, um, actually they go to our church, and the smoke alarms went off in the middle of the night. None of them smelled anything, and the heater was, was fixing to catch on fire. There was smoke coming out. And, at, you know, you can get damage from smoke inhalation and, I mean, not realize what's happening to you. But that's a thing. That's a warning system. And, you know, the Word of God is our is our kind of warning and as well inside of us we have the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus our Lord and Savior and he'll warn us he'll show us things to come and we can tell when things are not right and when we read the word sometimes the word will jump and we'll realize ooh that applies to me and it might not even be a scripture that really is about that situation but you know God is using it to speak to you and it's like don't ignore those things it's like the smoke detector it's there to save your life to help you and the Word of God is there. And the Holy Spirit is there to show you things to come, to help you, to teach you, to guide you. He's a guide. If you've ever been to Israel and you ever had a tour guide, I have. Man, they show you everything. They know the shortcuts to get at everything. They know all about everything. It's really interesting. Some of those people may not have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they know all about Him. They know all the history. And the thing is, he, the Holy Spirit is our guide and teacher. And He does know everything. And, of course, you know, he knows the heart of the Father and what we to do in the plan of God for your life. So, now, the next thing are signs. Traffic signs. Now, most of you watch this probably are too young to drive, although your parents may not are, of course, probably drive. But you're aware of road signs. How about the do not enter? Well, you don't want to go there because obviously there's a reason why it's not to enter. It's probably a one way and you're going the opposite way. Not good. Especially there's one that says wrong way. You know, don't go there. Those signs are protect, put up for your protection and for others. Speed limit 40. What happens if you decide you're going 60 or 70? Well, you may have a, hear a siren going and see some lights and realize that you're going to get a ticket because you're speeding. And it could be a school zone, and that could involve the lives of children, like there's people walking there, whatever. Or when it says don't pass, because there's not enough vision. It's not so uh, the government wants it, so you're not going to have any fun. It's to protect you. Or how about a railroad crossing? Those trains take a long time to stop because they're so big, and you, you don't try to outrun a train. So we need to be aware of these things. And a stop sign means what it says. You know, I tell a story about the guy who, 
you know, it wouldn't stop or whatever. It just slowed down. He told that to the officer, and it was a British officer, had one of those rubber clubs, and he's, he said, and started beating on him. He's, and the guy says, stop it. And he says, well, I could just slow down. And he said, when I say, when it says stop, it means stop. Good point. Detour. You don't want to go somewhere where it says detour. There's a reason why they detour you around. And like the curve in the road, don't be going high speed if there's a curve, like especially at night, because you can miss a turn and have a wreck. And the signals, they're there for your protection. They're there for other people's protection. Or it might be even be just gas. Like I remember I was driving one stretch of road in Oregon. I didn't realize it back then. It was 100 miles between gas stations. So when they had a sign for the gas, they wanted you to fill up because you weren't going to get another opportunity and you better have enough in your gas tank or you might not be going anywhere. So uh, it pays to pay attention to these things that are going on in our life. They're there for a reason. And so uh, we're, we're told these things. And um, just like the smoke detector uh, warns us, the yo-yo does it, but there again, we want to be consistent in our walk with God. We want to be a person who's faithful to read the Word, to be in church, just doing those things that uh, we're to do as believers. Well, today we have a story, another one of our stories, and you know this is a new squids on the block, and and these guys are new to the town in any way. They're at Sunday school, and that <coughs> here is here's Tim and there's Tommy, Tim and. Tommy Turtle, and they've been around <laughs> about in the dock a lot, and they're here at Sunday school, and they've learned some things, and there are other kids that came, or, or squids and the, uh, those that came to the Sunday school and came to the services, and the teacher was trying to warn them about, particularly about minnows of all things, and of course they like to eat minnows, but she was talking about how they were um, up on the dock that they would catch fish either with a string with a hook and and lots of times they put a minnow a tasty minnow on there and and the fish would bite it and then they get hooked and it talked about how sometimes they put out nets and you didn't necessarily see them and she was warning them to be careful because sometimes they see all these tasty little fish and they think oh great snack we love those and they want to go feed on them and they'd end up caught and their lives were over and so Tommy the turtle said, yeah, I know that's true. And so she was describing how sometimes the net would be hard to see and the fish would be swimming in and out and around and they would want to eat those minnows. And that's what Sunday school teachers warning them. She said, I can't tell you how many, you know, have been captured and caught because they didn't listen. And so we need to be people that when we're warned about things, we pay attention. So here they are. And, ooh, they see the minnows and everything, and they all like, oh, yeah, we love those. They're so good, and we're hungry. So they started swimming toward them, and it's like, wow. And so the Timmy and Tommy were going like, those guys are going to get caught. And they would tell them, and the guys would kind of blow them off, like, yeah, okay, well, I don't see any line. I don't see any hook. Um, so one day, they were swimming, and there were like diamonds all around. And the closer they got, they realized they were minnows, and they were all around. And they thought, wow, this is great. Man, we're hungry. We want a snack. We're going to eat some minnows. And they remembered, you know, Timmy and Tommy said, remember, you guys, that this can be a trap. That lots of times they have all these, and then there's either the hooks or lines or net. And they were like, oh, we don't see anything. It'll be okay. We're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Well, they had been warned, hadn't they? And yet here they were. How many times are people warned or are we warned and we know we shouldn't do certain things and we think, well, I'll get by with it. And sometimes you do, but not always. And it only takes one time, especially if you're a fish and they're pulling up a line, that's the end of your life. So this time, Timmy and Tommy felt very strong. Don't go near these. There's something wrong here. We're warning you. Stay away. You're going to get caught. It's going to be the end of you. And they were like, they're always trying to ruin our fun. No, they weren't trying to ruin their fun. They were trying to save their life. 
And we see this today, people making foolish decisions. So, um, they decided to heck with them. They were going anyway. So they rushed on over, and they were enjoying eating those or trying to eat those minnow. When all of a sudden, guess what happened? They felt them, there was a big net, and they felt the thing be pulled up. And they realized, we're going up. We're in this thing. And, of course, the minnows were small enough that they could just go right on through the holes. And they were like suckers, cannery, candidate, fish bait, calling them names. And they were like, there was no escape. They were caught. They were trapped. And it's just, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, there's things today that people are, are doing that are they're going to get themselves in trouble. Well, they didn't escape, but Timmy and Tommy the turtle did because they didn't fall for it. They knew better. They knew to beware. They knew to be careful. And, you know, you can listen. Sometimes people want you to do things. You know in here, you have this icky, scratchy feeling. Uh, I shouldn't do it. Don't do it. Or, you know, when it's something that's God for you to do, you can have this really nice, warm, velvety feeling. But don't be fooled because the Holy Spirit will speak to you. He'll show you things to come. And he'll warn you. Don't ignore those things. You know, people can say, well, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Or, oh, I've been confessing the scripture. There was a lady, and she, I'm going to tell this story. And she went up to a man of God, and she said, I believe God, and I got robbed. And where was God in all that? And so um, he said to her, well, did you feel any warning? Oh, I confess Psalm 91 over me that I was protected. And he said to her, yes, but did you have this check, what we call a check, or a, a feeling that mm, maybe I shouldn't do it? She said, yes, but I just believe the word of God, and I confess Psalm 91. And he says, well, you were warned. You overrode that. And as a result, you got robbed. Don't override it. And um, because it could cost you. God wants to warn you. God wants to help you on things. But you've got to do your part too. And your part is to listen. Read the word. Pray. Talk to God. And when you get those things, that's God talking to you. So. Now. There's a real heaven and a real hell. And when you leave this earth, if you haven't made a choice, you have made a choice. You do not want to go to hell. Jesus talked a lot about hell. He used the word hell. But I'm going to tell you that's a place you don't want to go. Jesus wants you in heaven. He wants to have you with him. But you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to make that choice. Your mother can't do it for you. Your grandmother can't do it for you. You have to make the choice. And the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's a fact. Um, every one of us needed a Savior. Every one of us was unable to do it ourselves. And, you know, we you think about the Garden of Eden, and we talked about this earlier, that we'd all sinned, and we needed, you know, Jesus died for us. Would he have had to suffer a death like that if it wasn't necessary? Well, no. <laughs> And so then it says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And you see, that cross makes a cross between, literally. And that's the thing, is that Jesus made a way so we didn't have to go to hell. Jesus took care of us. And so uh, because of that, uh, we can have eternal life. Now, how do you do that? Well, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if we'll believe in our heart and say with our mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, we can be saved. And so the Bible also says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're whosoever, right? And like I said, if I asked you, if you die today, would you go to heaven? And you go, well, I think so. I'm a pretty good person. No, there's only one way. It's through Jesus. 
And so it's asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and then living the life for him. Because you can say it with your mouth and make a confession, but, you know, then where's the proof of it? Where's the fruit of it where you're living for God? Because when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to live for God. You need to realize you need to be in church. You need to be reading the Word. You need to be talking and praying to Him because that's all part of it. He's either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. So if you would like, we will go ahead and we'll, have this, we'll say this confession together. And you can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Um, you might be sitting in a room with somebody who doesn't go to church anymore or whatever or who would like to rededicate. They can do this too. And if you say this prayer, we would love to send you a gift. We'd love to hear from you. So let's say this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I do believe God raised you from the dead. I believe it's my heart. And I'm saying it with my mouth. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Wow. Now, make sure that you get yourself in a good church. You say, well, I don't know any. Well, ask around with your friends for wherever it is you live. And if they have a church they go to, maybe your parents will take you or you can ride with them. And then... Get yourself a Bible, and, and I know people have it on their phones, but you need a real one to read where you can look at it. It makes a difference. And then talk to God. You know, you don't have to use Elizabethan type, King James type language. Just talk to him and respect him. Put aside a certain time of your day to spend some time talking to him, waiting on him. The Bible says, be still and know I'm God. Well, we're running low on time. And like I said, if you just accepted Jesus, we would love to hear from you. And in the meantime, um, just keep, uh, keep uh, reading the Word and doing all those things that you know to do. And we'll see you next time.